Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us on the third day of the Winter School Program. Uh, my name is Dana El Kurd. I'm a researcher at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and a assistant professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Uh, it's my great privilege to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Lisa Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is the James T. Shotwell Professor Emerita of International Relations at the School of International and Public Affairs in Columbia University. She's a specialist in politics in the Middle East and North Africa, and she has served as the Dean of the School of uh, International and Public Affairs from 1996 to 2008, um, as well as the Chair of the University's Political Science Department. Um, Dr. Anderson is the author of a number of books, uh, including Pursuing Truth, Ex Exercising Power, Social Science and Public Policy in the 21st Century, and The State and Social Transformation in Tunisia and Libya. Um, and she's also the editor of Transitions to Democracy and co-editor of The Origins of Arab Nationalism. And we're very happy uh, to have her today to discuss the rise and retreat of the state in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, you will have uh, up to an hour to speak, and I will give you a 15-minute and then five-minute heads up. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dana, and thank you all for um, the invitation to be able to speak with you today. This is uh, um, quite a pleasure for me um, to be able to sort of pull my thoughts together about a set of issues that I've been thinking about for quite a long time. Um, I, it's not a happy story at the end of the day, and if any of you can think of ways to um, turn the conclusions that I come to to a more optimistic um, tenor, I would be delighted by that. So let me get started. I'm going to share my screen, if I may, um, and then we can get going. Okay, um, once again, I wanna thank you for the invitation and um, talk a little bit to today about the, as I've said, the rise and retreat of the state in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, this is important in my view in and of itself. It's something that I've been um, preoccupied by for a very long time. Um, but I think it's also important as I will suggest at the end of my remarks because um, the state for all of its uh, difficulties and foibles, if you will, um, also is the progenitor of a set of rights and a conception of citizenship that I think we will um, miss when it's gone. Uh, so let me start with a sort of classic definition. This is pretty much what all of you would be familiar with. Um, this is Max Weber in 1919, um, who described a state pretty much the way all social scientists have since then. We can discuss, there are some elements to what we think of as a state today, which he does not include, but again, a compulsory political association with continuous organization. Um, whose administrative staff successfully upholds a claim to the monopoly of the legitimate use of force in the enforcement of its order in a given territorial unit. There are two elements to this that are usually considered um, particularly important, one of which is the famous monopoly of the legitimate use of force, um, which includes obviously all military um, and, but also policing. Um, on the one hand, and the other is the given territorial unit, and that's gonna turn out to be important in our story. Um, so in about 1648, the famous year of the Peace of Westphalia, this is a little bit what the world looked like. And what's important here is several features of what that world looked like. Um, and again, I like maps. I'm gonna be using maps a lot in the discussion today, um, but they're a little bit um, misleading in some ways because they're about territory. So they're very presentist, they're very status, they're very much about control of territory. But what's important about this presentation of the world is that it wasn't really about territory. Although this is an effort to convey through a map what the world looked like, what the world actually looked like was sets of political um, organizations and hierarchies and communities and so forth that weren't really about territory. They were about other kinds of identities and other kinds of um, 
notions of political authority. So as a result of that, one of the things that you see here is that there are large swaths of this map that don't have or don't appear to have much um, authority controlling them. So take the Sahara Desert. There aren't very many people there. Um, and partly as a result of that, no one is claiming it. Um, it doesn't really matter because control of territory wasn't the important feature of these um, these kinds of institutions. Now, in some ways they were states, in some ways they had very elaborate administrative organizations. They tended to be pretty continuous across generations. But the two features that people pull out of the Weberian definition um, were absent. They did not enjoy a monopoly of the legitimate use of force. There was other organizations that competed with um, these formal organizations in using violence, and obviously they weren't territorial. All right, so something happened between 1648 and now, um, now of course looking like this, where among other things, the globe's land is covered. Um, we don't dispute, well, we do dispute at the margins um, control of territory, but we don't dispute that territory should be controlled. All of us in 2021 think that there should be some authority responsible for um, all territory in the world and on the globe. Um, so something happened between 1648 and today. Um, also notice, as is always remarked about the um, particularly clear here in Africa, the um, extent to which some of the lines that distinguish one state from another are straight. Um, that is to say, they were not born out of the natural features of the landscape, um, but imposed in some way. So the question then becomes, where did these kinds of states come from? And most of this is history, which it's certainly the political scientists among you and probably all of you are familiar with in one way or another. But because I want to talk about the consequences of retreat, I am going to rehearse some of this history. So you have the Peace of Westphalia. This is 1648. That was when I showed you what the world looked like, give or take a little. What you couldn't see on that map was how complicated Europe was. Europe was lots and lots of these tiny little principalities, all of whom were competing for um, power among themselves in the what was then known as the, what has become known as the 30 Years War. There were 194 parties, and that's one of the reasons why that picture seems sort of appealing to me, it, is it conveys how many people were invested in developing some kind of mechanism for conflict resolution. Um, so there was this effort to resolve this endemic conflict in Europe. And there were three principles that were established coming out of those um, that conclave, one of which was territorial sovereignty. So finally, we begin to see territory as something that is associated with political authority. Um, once you have that territory, so you are one of these princes and the territory is associated with you, other princes are not supposed to interfere in activities within your territory. So that's the non-intervention. A principle, both principles continue to be upheld by the United Nations, among others, that territorial sovereignty is part of being a recognized independent state. And there is a principle of non-intervention in the affairs of other states. Um, the recent efforts to think about um, responsibility to protect um, that took place after the genocide in Rwanda and was adopted to some degree by the United Nations is a very interesting violation of that principle, but um, we can get to that later. And finally, each of these states were legally the equivalent of other states. So they weren't necessarily empirically the equivalent. Some were larger, some were smaller, some were more powerful, so forth and so on. But in principle, they were all equal. That too is something of a novelty because if you think about the imperial era of that day, which I showed you at the beginning in the earlier map, um, the idea that all states would somehow be equal with each other in um, something that was beginning to be understood as international law 
was something of a novelty. All right, so this is where this system that we typically think of as sort of, you know, existing since the beginning of time that we live with came from. Um, so then it began in Europe and the Europeans took this idea and expanded it throughout the world. So the Westphalian state system, this idea of territoriality, non-interference, and legal equality was basically exported everywhere through imperialism. We can talk about the various ways that happened. Um, what's, and, and it was very complicated, as you could well imagine. We're talking about several centuries. But for all intents and purposes, that system where territory was associated with political authority and where other political authorities were not supposed to be interfering in the in, internal, if you will, affairs of the original political authority and so forth and so on, and these were legally equal, were exported. So you began to see the principle that no territory should go unruled um, in this period. So this came to a sort of mid-level fruition in the League of Nations um, in the um, after the First World War. Um, when you began to see uh, an effort to codify this system. And it was a halfway house between um, an imperial era and a system where all of the states of the world would be actually formally equal. But the empires of the world, if you will, were formally equal. All right, so finally, during this period, and particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, states began to take something of a different features. Um, they were no longer simply the realms of a ruler. So during the 19th century, what had been realms of rulers, so, and even when you, you know, if you read about the 19th century British empire, it was really Victoria's empire. It was very much still conceptually the realm of the ruler began to be an expression of national will. So you begin to hear about nation states, um, which was actually a novelty. There wasn't the, I, these original states were not associated with nations, but there was a claim that if, if there was a, uh, a state, it should be reflecting something more than the ruler's um, realm. It should be reflecting something about the people who lived there. Um, so state was repurposed in a way as an expression of national will. You will see lots of nation states and you begin seeing groups claiming to be nations aspiring to statehood. Diplomacy was no longer simply the emissaries of the monarch. Um, you began to see the claims of uh, essentially proto-democratic, that citizens of these states were supposed to have accountable governments. So there was a claim of government accountability that was reflected in demands to vote, for example. And so a king or a monarch wasn't simply there by the grace of God or by um, the good fortune of birth, but was actually the ruler was supposed to reflect something about the nature of the interests of the people. So you had states associated with nations, states associated with um, regimes that were supposed to be accountable to members of those nations understood as the people or parts of the people. And then you had battles all the way through the 19th century and all the way through the 20th century of who counted as part of the people. Um, in the United States, originally those people who were to whom the president was supposed to be accountable at the beginning of the, at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century were white male property owners. Suffrage expands over the course of the 19th and 20th century, the, so citizenship in a sense expands, but for all intents and purposes, that idea that the ruler is supposed to be accountable to some popular 
interests um, was established. That meant that sovereignty as a idea also changed and it wasn't simply that of the sovereign, in other words, the ruler, but it's inherent in a nation. So again, you have this nation state and it was the nation that was sovereign or aspiring to sovereign status. And equally importantly, became, it became necessary for kind of full scale statehood, if you will, to be recognized by an international community. So keep in mind the peace of Westphalia was interesting in part because it was an agreement among princes, among sovereigns, to abide by a set of rules that bound them all. That was international law. You now have that idea expanded well beyond Europe and well beyond those princes to say that there is going to be a, an international community that abides by certain conventional laws. The League of Nations was the first effort to make that work, to formalize it, to say we are all in this community of nations together. Obviously, it failed for a variety of reasons, and the United Nations was the next, next effort to do that, to be the embodiment of uh, conviction that there needs to be a formal membership organization, if you will, that reflects and expands and to some limited degree enforces international law. So now you've got two elements to the state, the Weberian element, which is, if you will, domestic. Um, and you have a lot of you know, expectations that the state will be able to um, enforce law and order in its own territory, that it will be territorial, that there will be boundaries, and that next to it will be another state with another regime for enforcing law and order within that territory and so forth and so on. So that was essentially the United Nations. Um, now, the United Nations took on a set of other aspirations again. So first you have these princes getting together and saying, you know, we're all equal, we'll acknowledge that or we'll, you know, stipulate that. And we are going to not interfere in what each other does and we're going to have territorial boundaries now. We have expanded that throughout the world. Um, now, and, and we have said that that is also part of being a state is that these are not just princes, these are nations that are adopting this form and, and uh, organizing together. The United Nations claims a bunch of other things, um, which are gonna turn out to be, um, I think important to us at this moment. One of which is this idea of the rights of men and women, that is to say the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the UN shortly after its founding and of nations large and small. So here you get this really interesting uh, tension between whether these states and the international system that supports and reinforces it is actually about nations or about individuals. And if it's about individuals, who protects the rights of those individuals? So we'll, I'll be coming back to that. Um, and so obviously respect the obligations arising from treaties. So now suddenly you have not only the Weberian state, but you also have what could be called a Westphalian state. That is to say, things that are recognized by the international system as sovereign states, whatever they look like domestically, okay? And the UN also promises to promote social progress and better standards of living and so forth and so on, something to which I will also return shortly. All right, so independence. This is 1950s. Um, at this point, it's, you know, the point is really to say, here we are back pretty close to what we look like um, it, by now. The, the whole conception of um, the world is that we have states and these are ours. All right, so now I'm gonna be talking more specifically about this part of the world. Um, but the, this part of the world is, and what it looks like and the straightness of so many of its lines and so forth and so on, is very much a reflection of that 
larger history, which I just described. I'm not going to reiterate how each of these states came to be and came to be recognized. You will recall that my earlier earliest map was a picture of what most of this was the Ottoman Empire. Um, a lot of it was uncontrolled. It didn't really matter. There weren't very many people there, and therefore there wasn't a concern with the territory as such. Obviously, we now have territorial control by some recognized or disputed authority everywhere. So we can talk about how these individual um, states and state aspirants came to be, but most of that, I assume, you're aware of. Okay, but what's interesting is it's, this is what you see, and this is sort of the, if you will, Westphalian version of this. This is the international recognized, these are the states. But the really interesting question is what did these states actually look like in Weberian terms? So what, these are two of my favorite quotes. They are obviously at the, at the moment of independence. Um, so Libya becomes independent in 1951. This is one of my favorite stories, the story of Libyan independence. The American ambassador said at the time that it, complete independence seemed to many to be a last resort, an expedient and an experiment. Um, Libya had been, um, as the Un United Nations took over the mandate system of the um, League of Nations, there was a substantial debate about what should happen to Libya, which had been an Italian colony. The Italians obviously lost the war. Um, so the Soviet Union volunteered to take Libya as a trusteeship. The United States um, vetoed that. And at the end of the day, the only thing the international community could agree on was independence. This was a country that had fewer literate people than it had in its parliament. Um, its principal export was scrap metal left over from the campaigns of the Second World War in North Africa. Yet, it became independent. And it became independent essentially as a ward of the international system. Although formally independent, the British and the United States subsidized the um, budget of the country for more than a decade as oil um, exploration took place. And obviously by the 1960s, Libya was exporting oil and wasn't in need of a budget subsidy. But the point is, this was a country that did not meet the Weberian standards for statehood. And in fact, most of the countries of the region um, did not. This second quote is about the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and this was a, uh, an economist who was writing at that time that he really did not think that these countries who were becoming independent could actually operate as sovereign states um, because they did not have milita adequate military strength to control the territory for which they were responsible and because they did not have the finances to pay for adequate military strength. Um, so in the Libyan case is a specific version of this larger sense on the part of many of the people who were involved in shepherding um, the countries of the Middle East and North Africa to formal independence that in practice, they didn't have the capa domestic capacity that would be necessary to constitute Weberian style states. Okay, fine. Did it matter? For a while, it actually didn't matter very much um, because the Cold War, which was a rant, you know, designed to create a sort of global stability in the um, face of substantial um, conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, um, permitted a mechanism by which larger powers would subsidize, support the regimes, friendly regimes in less important or less powerful countries. Okay, so this was really a set of alliances. So the blue is what was known at the time as the free world. Um, and the red is the Soviet Union and its pink allies um, and Russia and China is sort of darker pink, I guess. 
Um, so it was a complicated world, but it was a mechanism by which the function of imperialism was extended through most of the 20th century. So you had the appearance, the sort of formalities of sovereignty, um, but not very much of the reality of it. But the rea that didn't show up. It wasn't as obvious because the Cold War permitted the imperial countries of the world, the United States and the Soviet Union at the time, to subsidize the activities of their client states. So Franklin Roosevelt was the person who said about the ruler of the Dominican Republic, he may be a bastard, but he's our bastard. That is to say, these were client states in this instance of the United States. Um, and the fact that they weren't particularly good rulers was of no consequence to either in that instance, the United States or ultimately um, the Soviet Union. All right. So through, I would argue, certainly the 1970s, um, you had a, a system whereby the international system, which lay around the world and kind of created this global system, um, obscured the relative weakness of many of the states of the world. Okay? By the time you get to the 1980s, even some of the relatively powerful states of the world are having difficulty paying for the state function, domestic state functions that they had taken on. So this was a fiscal crisis of the state. And again, we can talk in more detail about this, but for all intents and purposes, the claim that the United Nations made that, that you know, these, this system would promote progress and better standards of life was turning out to be more expensive. And there just wasn't a mechanism by which domestic taxes would be paying for the obligations that had been taken on by these states. So the states were increasingly seen by people like Thatcher and Reagan and Gorbachev and so forth as bloated, too big, unaffordable, doing things they shouldn't be doing, so forth and so on. So this is system began to shift at this point, saying this wasn't really this neo-imperialism of supporting states that weren't paying their own way, and even the social programs of the relatively powerful states and the military commitments of the relatively powerful states were simply not affordable. So the relatively powerful states, the UK, the USSR, the United States, begin to develop an alternative vision of the way the world should organize. And that was essentially codified in what came to be known as the Washington Consensus. That is to say, states should shrink from the obligations that they've taken on, um, and the market would provide the mechanisms for economic growth, development, and therefore social progress and better standards of living. So you get a period of essentially globalization. Um, I'm just gonna give you some indications here of the kinds of things that happened since the 1990s um, in the world. Again, we'll look back at the Middle East shortly, um, but clearly trade skyrocketed. Um, particularly um, after the 1980s and 90s, um, more and more countries had trade as a share of their GDP become an important element of their um, economies. They opened, they, and again, some of this was driven by the political authorities in countries in, again, the Soviet Union, in fact, disappeared as a result of this and became Russia and the independent states um, born in the Soviet Union. The United States became ideologically neoliberal, um, even under democratic presidents. Um, so some of this was um, the rulers themselves, if you will. Some of it was dictated by the international financial institutions. Um, that were the origins of the Washington Consensus. Um, but whether you wanted to do it of your own accord or whether you were doing it because you were dependent on international financial transactions of some kind or another, almost all the countries of the world um, 
move toward um, greater openness, um, including trade. Um, migration began to pick up quite dramatically. There was an earlier period of migration at the about 100 years ago, um, and then it slowed down in the middle of the 20th century and began to pick up again um, as people moved, as you can see from this map, all over the place. Um, and the so you got movements of goods in trade, you got movements of people, um, and as a result of a lot of those kinds of developments, you also had increasing inequality. Now, I'd like to point out something about the Middle East here on the issue of inequality. Um, the Particularly the Arab world was regarded as one of the most egalitarian um, regions in the world during from the 1950s into the 1980s. Um, interestingly, as a region, and and I don't have a I don't have a slide for this, but I can provide data for those of you who are interested. Not only regionally, but also within country. By the time you get to 1990s, the Middle East is one of the least egalitarian country, regions of the world. It remains reputationally quite egalitarian um, for some time after that, but it's clear from the data starting in 1990, as you can see here, that whatever it looked like in the 1950s and 60s, it no longer looked that way. And inequality grew dramatically. Now, during the same period, as many people point out, global inequality in some ways rectified. Because, so you saw somewhat less inequality globally, but that was almost all accounted for by China's ability to bring um, a couple billion people out of poverty. Um, for most of the rest of the world, inequality grew fairly dramatically. Um, and the Middle East, it didn't grow, it just didn't change. All right, so here, this is what you began to see as a function of several decades of um, growing abandonment, if you will, of the state as the principal mechanism by which um, uh, goods and values, if you will, are distributed around the world, both domestically um, and internationally. And markets become increasingly powerful as ways that decisions about allocation is, are made. So the decisions about allocation are made partly by moving goods around, partly by moving people around, but in general, the, those decisions had been leading to greater inequality. So what does this mean about the state? So you still have states. There, we all live in states. We're all here and we're all thinking about what our government is doing and so forth and so on. But what does it mean about how states operate in the world? Well, one thing that's interesting is that states begin to compete in markets in ways that they hadn't before. So let's start with the you know growth of sovereign wealth funds. This, I think, is really interesting. And I think a lot of people haven't really quite understood the consequences of sovereign wealth funds and the fact that they have become not only very large, the ones that exist, but they have proliferated around the world. So lots of countries that you wouldn't expect to have a sovereign wealth fund do. And what they do is make investments um, as if they were any other kind of wealth fund. So they are picking and choosing investments that they anticipate being able to profit from. So suddenly states are in the business of making a profit. Now, you know, they can say that profit is going to be reserved, as the Kuwaitis always have said, for um, future generations, that they're essentially using this mechanism by which to ensure that future generations will be able to enjoy the fruits of oil revenues that they don't need to spend now. But many of these other countries, Singapore doesn't have any oil revenues, um, for example, South Korea doesn't have any oil revenues, and many of the other countries in the world that are now developed, Egypt has a sovereign wealth fund now, um, are beginning to say, this is a different kind of way of raising revenues. Rather than tax, 
we're actually going to see if we can make money in the market. And that is going to be um, perhaps more, um, generate more revenues than taxes would, but it certainly seems at least in the short run to relieve us of the obligation to impose taxes at home because taxes are never popular. So if you're a government, you're saying, you know, if I can find some other way to raise revenues, I'd like to do that. So you see lots and lots of states beginning to go into the market as a way to raise money. Um, and when they do that, they're making choices about where they're investing. So this is the other um, graphic on this slide. The sovereign wealth fund, this is, you know, it doesn't really matter. I could show you lots and lots of these kinds of data about the decisions that sovereign wealth funds make about where they're going to put money, they're going to make deals in Latin America for soybeans, or perhaps in the United States for soybeans, or whatever other kinds of things in agriculture they're interested in. The point of that is not to develop Brazil, or not to contribute to the social progress of Central Asia, but to make money. And that's what wealth funds do. So you now begin to see states increasingly acting as if they were um, corporations. And in fact, many, this is a very difficult slide to read. I apologize for that, but it doesn't really matter because these are the top countries and corporations by revenue. The black lines are countries, the red lines are corporations. So you can tell within the top 100, most of them are actually corporations. And Walmart is number 10, higher than Spain, higher than Australia, so forth and so on. The point here is we're now in a world where these states, through sovereign wealth funds and other mechanisms, are com increasingly competing with and behaving as if they were corporate, as opposed to this notion that there's something different about what states are supposed to do. States increasingly are supposed to work in this world where they are trying to you know, develop revenue sources, uh, not unlike their um, corporate competitors, and they're competing with them. And finally, and this is a, again a, a slide that needs a little bit of explanation, another way states are beginning to raise revenues is sell citizenship. So these are the country, the top countries um, selling citizenship. And the way you sell citizenship is almost literally somebody pays to become a citizen by investing, making an investment in the country or otherwise providing the government with revenue. Um, Egypt, usually there's some pretense, if you will, that this is, you're, be, you're getting this citizenship, citizenship because you're making an investment in Grenada or you're making an investment in St. Kitts and Nevis. In fact, there's not much to invest in, so you're transferring money to the country, paying to become a citizen. There are a lot of values to that. Most of the tops, top of this list are countries with very low tax rates, so part of this is about tax avoidance for wealthy individuals, but it's also, um, importantly, about, for the governments themselves, a revenue source. Egypt has recently expanded the uh, rules for becoming a citizen of Egypt, which were until quite recently extremely difficult. You couldn't just up and become an Egyptian citizen if you wanted, want, wanted to. Now, you don't have to actually invest. You simply have to put a certain amount of money in the Egyptian government bank account. So you are literally buying citizenship in Egypt. Um, the Egyptian government claims that this is again, a way to, to encourage investment in Egypt. Um, I'm not sure how many people have taken up the Egyptian offer to uh, invest in Egypt in this way, but it's certainly available. Okay, so finally, so you see this, the marketization of the state or the commercialization of the state. Um, something which was pretty much inconceivable, certainly when the United Nations was established, and I would argue up until the mid, say, 1980s in any event, that the state and the market were very different realms of authority, very different ways of allocating values, 
conceptually different in terms of how hierarchies operate and so forth and so on. At this point, these things have become increasingly hard to pull apart, um, except in the way that we kind of an overhang of what we believe these this terminology means, at least. Finally, whatever happened to the monopoly of the legitimate use of force? Well, of course, um, this is a map of American military involvement of one kind or another uh, around the world. I, one could do other countries. The United States is clearly the most um, militarized of the great powers, clearly the country that has the most military activity outside its own territory. Um, but I sort of want to flip this around and point out that not only is the United States militarily um, vastly exceeding its territorial limits, if you will. But this also means that these countries are essentially um, outsourcing the monopoly of the legitimate use of force, at least in part, to the United States. They're, um, this permits them to get relatively, by the standards of a local taxpayer, um, high quality military um, enforcement for relatively low cost. Uh, since the United States subsidizes some of this, um, at least in some places. So the monopoly of the legitimate use of force is essentially gone, probably around the world, um, but certainly in many of the parts of the world that we're interested in. Okay, so I'm beginning to wind down here because I want us to be able to talk about the specifics of the Middle East. But what are the kinds? Of, what are the alternatives to the state? What are the kinds of things? If the state is beginning to morph into something else, what is it morphing into? What can we imagine are going to be the sort of political organizations, the kinds of authority, the people who provide us with values that we think are important to us, and so forth? That's not going to look like. And I don't know what the answer to that is. So some of this is a little bit facetious. Some of what I'm going to described as alternatives to the state are obviously in part silly. Um, but I but I want to do it as a way to provoke a discussion about what the kinds of what are governments or how are they beginning to think about themselves. Um, keep in mind that, for example, the ruler of Dubai describes himself as the CEO. Um, and I think in many ways the um, countries with large sovereign wealth funds and relatively small populations and a lot of uh, foreign workers are actually operating as if they were corporations. They have lots of employees. They have their family-run businesses. Um, and that may serve um, some of the interests and it may allocate some of the values that we think are important, but they certainly aren't going to do what states historically have been expected to do. So, you know, how else can we organize ourselves? Well, I was thinking maybe alphabets. Maybe we can be, you know, everybody who uses a particular kind of alphabet can get themselves together and say, this is our identity. This is who we are. This is how we want to be um, governed. Obviously, that's not going to happen, nor am I serious about it. But there begin to be other conceptions of what are important to us that may be important. For example, now here's something that's been very, very contentious ever since Samuel Huntington published his book in the 1990s about the clash of civilizations. Um, but in some ways, it does appear that these kinds of spots on the map, if you will, um, have a kind of resonance with many people. They are as likely to be the sorts of loyalty uh, focus of loyalty as the state in which the individuals live. So I'm as likely, or anyone who is likely to think of themselves as a member of a particular philosophical tradition or a particular religious community, um, as I am to think of myself as a, a citizen of a state which is no longer serving many of the purposes that it had originally um, claim to be able to serve. 
Um, this is also facetious, but I think it's kind of interesting because I do think that one of the things we need to be thinking about when we think about the shifts that are being made in what states look like um, is the role of new information technologies, broadly speaking. Um, and I've always thought that one of the communities that we haven't considered the political implications of as much as we might is our media community. So this is now the extent of Facebook. Facebook has, it is the principal um, social media platform for all of the countries in blue. Um, China obviously has its own, um, and as it turns out, much of the former Soviet Union also seems to have a different social media platform. Um, this has become, if you if you look at this, this is Facebook has become increasingly powerful over the last 15 years, as you might expect, um, and has devoured some of the local um, social media platforms that existed um, some years ago. But if if in a sense, nationhood, according to Benedict Anderson, um, was an imagined community as we began to think of ourselves together with other people who used the same alphabet, who seemed to be the same ethnic community, who looked at the newspapers and saw themselves mirrored there. That's part of the way he argued that print capitalism created these communities that were nations. I can't believe that this kind of new me social media capitalism isn't also going to create imagined communities that have some kind of political resonance ultimately. What that's gonna look like, I have no idea. I would really love people to begin to do some research and thinking about that, but be that as it may, I've put the question mark there for a reason. Um, well, sorry to interrupt, um, yeah. but you have um, 13 minutes. Oh, I'm almost done. As okay. you can see, things have gone to hell in the handbasket. <laughs> <laughs> so the rich, so the state is retreating. I don't know what kinds of mechanisms are going to begin to replace it to fulfill some of the functions that historically, that is to say, for the last couple of centuries, states were expected to fulfill. So. The UN says that the succeeding generations will be protected from the scourge of war. Obviously, um, nobody's doing that now. There is no monopoly of the legitimate use of violence in much of the world, including most the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and these mechanisms, that is to say, these states, are not promoting social progress and the standards of life and larger freedom. These are This is the language, as you'll recall, from the UN Charter. So this coming together of these institutions to promote these kinds of things has obviously not worked. Um, and that shows a little bit in the way we think of the United Nations and that it is a, you know, a set of institutions from the past. But the problem is not the UN itself. It is the um, entities on which it is structured. It is the idea that these territorial states will operate in a certain kind of way to provide these goods that we think are important. So the state retreats, um, some of us leave. We, are, we leave where we are, so you saw the migration um, earlier, or we're forced to leave where we are because not only is the state not providing us goods and services and prospects that we think we can get elsewhere, um, but in addition to that, it is actually, um, the greatest enemy of the people it is supposed to be protecting. So you see um, responses like exit. You see responses like voice, rebellion. I'm gonna do something completely different. I'm going to have a different state, a different conception of political legitimacy, a different conception of, of um, how I am ruled, how the government is accountable to me, how the government is legitimized, so forth. So I'm gonna do something completely different. Um, the map shows, if you will, hotspots, um, places where there's been quite a lot of that. Um, I think it will happen in different ways in different places, but I think this idea that people will abandon whatever last 
hope they had that the state in which they live is going to serve any of their purposes, they will either leave or they will try and bring down that state for other purposes seems pretty much inevitable. Okay, so this is my second, my penultimate slide. Why does it matter? Why do we care? What are the kinds of things that we're going to begin to have to think about when we think about the demise of the state? Because in many ways, many of us, and understandably so, this is left over from the neoliberal agenda, but it's also left over from other anti-imperial agendas and so forth and so on, the state has seemed oppressive. The state, reg the regimes of most of these states have seemed as if they did not care about the citizens for whom they were ostensibly responsible. So people, you know, good riddance to it. And many people argue good riddance to the state. My concern is a concern that Hannah Arendt argued um, in 1951, that this is going to be a mechanism by which we force millions of people out of this system of states and citizens. Because remember, citizens are an artifact of states, just as states themselves were these formal agreements of equality among the princes and so forth and so on. Citizens were a formal agreement that states would recognize the formal equality of the people who lived within them and recognize their formal um, accountability to these people. Absent states, absent citizens. And that's what I'm really concerned about because the UN has great language about the universal, about universal human rights, which is really about the kinds of things that citizenship endowed individuals with over the course of the 18th, 19th, 20th century. Those, those have been universalized. They no longer obtain only to the people in a particular territory. The UN says they are universal. They are because we are human beings. But no one is prepared to enforce them. The only enforcement mechanism that was ever designed around this idea of ensuring universal human rights was actually the monopoly of the legitimate use of force that states were supposed to enjoy. In the absence of that, people are not going to enjoy those kinds of rights. Um, so we will live in the conditions of savages. And this is obviously uh, a slide that's designed to be kind of uh, provocative. I don't think these are the only ways one lives in the conditions of savages. Um, the absence of citizenship, of the formal rights of legal equality, means that we will have to have privileges because we're rich or prerogatives because we're well-born or benefits because we are employed. And if we are none of those things, for whatever reason, we will not have access to the values that we think in the 21st century obtain for human beings. And on that note, I welcome um, your comments and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Um, so I will monitor the Q&A and the hand raising function. So let me see. Um, sorry, I just have to scroll up. So we have two. Um, I, I think some people are also raising their hands via picture, but if you can um, press the raise hand function near your name. If, if, you're, if you're having trouble, you know, just, just let me know. But Okay, it seems like people are, are getting it, perfect. So let's let's go ahead and do it by um, by order. So Arash was the first person who had a uh, comment or question. So you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for this uh, fascinating uh, introduction to the question of a state. I think it's, uh, it's very timely and uh, and very important to, uh, to think about. Um, I, have, I have two general observations. First of all, I have to say that, um, frankly, Professor Anderson, I'm not convinced by um, the observation of, of, I don't think a state is as challenged as basically um, you portrayed it to be. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced of, of you know, that the empirical basis of any of the challenges that you introduced are in fact so strong as to have fundamentally uh, weakened the notion of the state. 
Um, it seems to me, if you look over the longer durée, the victory of the state, um, it's, um, you know, its existence, uh, it, it being seen as the legitimate authority by the vast majority of citizens and in the world, um, I mean, that's the striking thing. The fact that there's a building in New York in which um, there is a representative um, of every almost corner on the planet um, and that everybody else accepts that they are the representatives. So we might not like North Korea, um, but North Korean leaders still meets with the Secretary General of the United Nations and no one disagrees that North Korea has authority over, over the area. It, that's, I think, the striking fact. Um, and I don't see any of the challenges that uh, you mentioned, frankly, as, as having significantly dislodged it. Uh, one can't get into the details here, but uh, I'll just say something that might be interesting. Um, the assassination of Soleimani, which we are in the anniversary, when one looks at the detail of that, you see that actually the United States went and picked, picked all the buttons that it must have. Um, I, it didn't even, um, like it attempted to not violate the, uh, to violate the sovereignty of Iraq on some basic levels as, as the interview shows basically, that it tried to uh, fulfill some legal obligations. And this is the United States under Trump, the most law violating anti-international rule of law person that we could have imagined. This so it looks like that the United States has to agree with the violation of uh, sovereignty of Iraq. And the second point that I'd say very briefly, um, in, in defense of a state, if you will, to put it uh, clearly, is that I'll point again to the region. And I think the movements of last year in, in 2019 in Iraq and Lebanon were effectively movements for citizenship. And I think this is also what also you pointed out throughout your talk. Um, and I very much agree with that. In fact, I think um, I think it is to, um, it's basically the Middle Eastern studies or the left-wing part of the Middle Eastern studies of which I see myself as part of, has made a grave error in the last few decades, basically, by putting most of its energy, if you will, um, in, in what you can call a state of skepticism of all sorts. This was, of course, a grave uh, change from the earlier direction of left-wing academia of anti-colonial academia, who were very much on the anti-colonial movements, wanted effective states. That was the pop, that was a big part of the movement. And I think it's still, it's a very, uh, you know, it was a very negative development, basically, that, that post-colonial studies weakened that. Um, and I think the movements in the region um, and uh, also movements inside academia are actually asking the question that you said at the end, that it looks like when you take the state away, uh, pretty, uh, you know, bad things uh, can happen very much. And defense of citizenship rights, um, as I said, in, in Iraq and Lebanon shows that there is very much, um, uh, the, the, the people very much are centered the movements around effective effective governance, if you will, and the state uh, structures and citizenship. Um, so some, yes, basically, I think, um, I think this is very much here to stay. And I, you know, uh, and I think also normatively um, it should be, and I think, um, you know, the, the direction of many popular movements in Middle East and other countries um, and shows that. Thank you. Dana, do you want me to respond or do you want to collect things? I think it was a bit of a meaty question, so maybe you can respond to it and then we can see if, you know, kind of what the other questions are like after. Okay, first of all, I think that was a great um, reaction and I'm very um, pleased and I'm not sure um, that we disagree very much. I think I am a, being a little bit of a Cassandra here. Uh, that is to say, I think if we don't pay attention now, we need to. So, and it also reflects, I think you're also correct in the sort of your um, characterization of the um, intellectual or academic history here. Um, keep in mind that I wrote the State in the Middle East and North Africa article in, in Comparative Politics, and it was published in 1987. To me, that was sort of the high watermark. And what we've seen since then is the kinds of things that I've been conveying, that I've been describing. I would like to say that this particular moment is another moment where you're going to see a switch and people are going to say, wait, 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 we're not so sure that this, you know, 30 years of deterioration of the state is actually what we had in mind. Um, and that we do want to reinvigorate or revive or reimagine this mechanism by which some of the things that we think are important to us will be um, sustained. I. I hope that's true, um, and I'd be very happy if it were true. Um, and your characterization of Lebanon and Iraq, I think, are, is correct in a way. That is probably 
the most heartening, you know, saying, no, we're going to live in a state and you're going to have to give us a good state and you're going to have to behave and will participate, you know, so forth and so on. I mean, I, so insofar as that's a, a way to think about that, I think that is both correct and heartening. Um, perhaps because I live pretty close to the um, headquarters of the UN, I, I share, I am uh, somewhat more skeptical about the international system. I think the Westphalian element of the state is still there, without a doubt. But I think it's a little bit of a, of a Potemkin village. I don't think there's a lot behind it. That's what I worry about. So right now, the question is, are we kind of pretending because we can't think of anything else? It's sort of like we're running on fumes. We know that. But before we say, well, the League of Nations was a failure and the UN was a failure, and we're going to have to invent something else, we have to be able to say it was a failure. And we're not really ready for that yet. But it, that doesn't mean that it's actually the Westphalian part is any is more than this kind of facade that is certainly in the interest of the great powers. Because if suddenly we said, well, you know, we're not really serious about this state in Africa, you guys can do whatever you want, that would be pretty chaotic. Not something that anybody is in a you know frame of mind to embrace. So the whatever might succeed that is obviously unknown. And so you hold on to what you know and what you have, even though it's not very effective and it's not doing any of the things that it was originally designed to do, but it's certainly keeping a lid on what may be more conflict, more difficulty and so forth than would otherwise be the case. So I don't, I think the Westphalian side of the state is um, performative in some ways and less, you know, but in some ways that was always true. So I'm not sure, you, you may be right that it's not that much different from what it was when, you know, it was the facade for the Cold War. Now it's the facade for something else. Um, that may be the case. I, I'm willing, I certainly will think about that. Thank you. Great, great observations. Thank you very much. So I think Aisha is next. Uh, thank you, Professor O'Curd. Uh, thank you, Professor Anderson. It was a great presentation. Actually, I'm writing my dissertation on performative statehood on digital rebel governance, and I look at ISIS. So, and I use um, your work actually quite a lot. But um, one thing that I wanted to, and one thing that I, I don't know, maybe it's um, too close to me also, but um, the idea that markets and states have not been together, because as we, I mean, as we know, even the Westphalian sovereignty. Um, began coming into question because they they began trading and they needed a currency and they didn't know how to invest in each um, in their central banks, the princes, how to change their money, how to exchange their money on shipping routes and when they were going. And the other thing of it was they were very particular in um, describing themselves as sovereign states. But for example, countries like Zanzibar and even the United States as non-sovereign states and just states. So, uh, and I think when we look into that and, and then that's one of the things actually ISIS, like you said, is against. They're against the whole Vespelian idea of having a European sovereign state as superior, and they see themselves as being um, throughout history being. Um, I mean, yeah, that's their whole logic. Let's put it that way. Um, that they're trying to very wrongfully, but yeah, um, trying to put on. But um, I was going to say, in the end of state, I think the performative statehood is becoming very important rather than the state itself is eradicating and um, and also markets in that sense um, are becoming very important for states themselves with their own currency, having currency wars, with not being able to enter international markets without currencies or without controlling the markets. So I was wondering what you think about that sense, not the markets as sovereign welfare found, but markets as almost monopoly over the market transactions under territories. Um, I, I think you're right to ask that I complexify that relationship to some degree. I'm not sure exactly where I would go with that, um, except to remind myself and all of you, of course, um, that British imperialism in South Asia was actually 
a function of a corporation that was the East India Company. So this distinction that I draw, the sort of stylized sense that these empires were the export of the state, in the first instance, of course, they were about markets and market expansion and that you know, the East India Company, it wasn't until the middle of the 19th century that the East India Company was basically taken over by the state um, of the British Empire. So when I said it was Victoria's, um, it was also the commercial interests of the empire. So I, I agree with that. And by the way, William Dalrymple's, the book called The Anarchy that just came out on the East India Empire is, um, East India Company is really interesting and quite, indicative of that. Um, so yes, I, I do think the, the, the relationship between states and markets has not been quite as stylized, separate hierarchy and market and so forth and so on as the way I characterized it. At the same time, I think perhaps one way that I'm going to start approaching this um, is this question of citizenship and what citizenship you know, where it comes from, who defines it, who endorses it, who, you know, because that is something that is, it seems to me, uniquely attached to this idea of state. And that's something, among other people, um, that Tim Mitchell has written about in his work on the state. He's also remarked that this a citizen is a, you know, a product of this state. Um, and I, and I think part of the reason why I I a little bit of a Cassandra here is that I actually don't care normatively that much about the international state system. What I do care about is how Lebanese or Iraqis or anyone else um, actually to whom they address their demands for protection of rights. And you're not going to address your demands to the East India Company or any company, that's not where rights come from. So somehow there has to be that purpose in the world that is the, is the recognition protection of these rights. And if it is a reinvigorated state system, then I'm happy with that. If it's something else, I'd be happy with that, frankly. Um, but I think the expectation that states do this without really thinking through whether in fact they are doing it and whether in fact they have the capacity to do it and whether in fact some of the mechanisms such as not taxing and getting revenues in other ways aren't counterproductive for that. Those are the sorts of questions I think are important. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, next is Maria. Yeah, well, I think some, some of the stuff have already been spoken about. And well, first of all, like, thank you very much for for your talk, it was really interesting and inspiring, and um, also helped me see things in in different way. Um, but as we are focusing on the Middle East, I think maybe um, all this idea of the state retreating, I see it more in other parts of the world. In the case of the Middle East, for example, if we take into consideration the uh, Arab Spring or the Arab uh, revolutions, however you want to call them. Like I think that uh, it was more an effort of a redefinition of, of the state, of what people want the state to be, rather than uh, wanting, the, uh, um, let's say, to be um, something more uh, transnational. Uh, if we think of other times in which, for example, pan Arabism play a really important role, uh, this is not that the kind of, of things that people are asking now for, it's more within their own countries, more much about the, their own um, identity and how Arash said about a redefinition maybe of, of, um, of citizenship. For example, in, in other way, in, um, for example, if you think also um, another, um, something else I wanted to say is uh, if we think um, also about this idea of the um, state and the market, uh, if we have the case of Lebanon, for example, one of the problems that Lebanon has, um, the citizens are demanding, is a, a less presence, uh, less presence of our market point of view of the state. No, like this idea of Hariri being such a neoliberal that uh, left the country in the hands of the markets. Uh, so, I'm, that's the reason why I think that maybe in in other uh, regions of the world it might be more uh, true that the um, the state is sort of retreating, but in 
in in the um, in the Middle East due to this re redefinition of the state as a main request of the Arab Spring and and also the retreat of the the uh, request of the retreat of of the market. I don't know if I explain myself well now. Hey, actually, I mean, this is a great, in general, this is a great conversation because what I'm hearing from you and from a couple of the other uh, participants here is that actually um, the costs of, a, of an absent state or an enfeebled state are more obvious in this region than in many other places. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and perhaps because it's been, I mean, I've said for some time now that I think the, and you know, you can well imagine here in New York, this doesn't seem that plausible, but more and more it does, I think, that the Middle East kind of show, shows us a future that it's a little bit ahead of the curve here. And so the costs of a state that does not serve its citizens was earlier apparent in this region. And so we're, we're not that, we're beyond experimenting with statelessness. That just, you know, it didn't, whereas in some other parts of the world, that retreat is continuing because we haven't hit that wall and said, you know, having a state that is my own enemy is not what I want. I want it, but that doesn't mean I want no state at all because I've seen what no state at all also looks like. And that is not serving my purposes. So to some extent, the periods of, of anarchy in you know, swaths of the region turn out to have been um, instructive. And people are beginning to say, no, it's not that I want to live without a state. I want to live with a competent, capable, accountable, responsive state. And again, I think Iraq and Lebanon that may be where we are with that. So, um, but I do think at the same time, there has been, uh, there was, now I'm listening to you guys and three people is not a lot, but I'm hearing this in, in some ways in the same direction, um, that there was a period, I think that people did retreat into smaller um, communal identities. You know, I think, you know, take Libya, that country has dissolved into very small identities now, towns and tribes and neighborhoods and so forth and so on. And that was true in a lot in other places as well. Um, if Libya ultimately within the next couple of years um, does begin to reconstruct a system that keeps the country together, or even divides it in two, but it's still not stays at this very local level. That I think will be the turnaround of saying, no, we need this kind of mechanism, this state that, you know, as I say, is capable and accountable. Um, and we're not going to say it's hopeless and we're gonna to turn to something altogether different. But I think there has been a lot of tension around that before and after the Arab Spring about what sort of identity can I have that will best serve my needs. Should I be, am I going to be better served in Egypt by being an affiliate of the Muslim Brotherhood or by being an affiliate of the National Democratic Party? Um, which of those is most likely to serve my interests and which of those is most associated with the state? And I think those kinds of debates took place for a while before the Arab Spring and for a while after the Arab Spring. And I think, um, you know, you may be right that, that, that those debates have sort of run their course. And at this point, people are saying, I don't want to be affiliated with either of those political parties, but I want an accountable state. Okay, um, I think we have one more question. And actually, I have a, a question that I'm going to read out, somebody who wrote it out as well. But I think Lara is first. So if you'd like to ask your question. Thank you for this amazing talk. It was very inspiring because it um, gave me new perspectives of the topic of the state. Um, 
I have just a little comment because we spoke or we heard a lot about citizenship and I think um, citizenship is not um, it's not only about rights, but um, it can also be a identity marker. And when we um, discuss the alternatives of state, I, I just thought that maybe we came into an identity crisis because um, sometimes citizenship is also, um, yes, like an emotional attachment. And then I thought about the society uh, in a state and which role it played for a state and how important a state also for society. Maybe it's a little bit out of topic, but it's because of I have another perspective of this uh, subject. Well, you raise a set of other issues that I think um, certainly I, and I hope we collectively do spend some time thinking about. There are different definitions of citizenship, obviously, and some of them are um, what I've been implicitly and probably should be more explicit about um, insisting on that, that it's a, essentially a legal um, identity as opposed to uh, ethnic or <clears throat> more social identity, as it were. Um, <coughs> and, you know, again, there's been some interesting work on the Middle East on citizen in the Middle East on citizenship and the extent to which citizenship um, does have a kind of ambiguous definition. Um, in order to become a citizen in most countries in the Arab world, you have to be able to speak Arabic and, and you have to be of good character. Um, I suppose those people who are buying citizenship in Egypt don't have to be of good character, I don't know. <laughs> um, but the point is that I think, you know, we might want to, 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 certainly I will want to sort of disaggregate that a little bit and think about, um, I'm, I'm obviously much more interested at this point in the, this kind of notion of rights, but you're correct to imply that some of that is because of an identity I hold for myself of a rights bearing person. And therefore I wanna be, be able to ensure that I and anyone else who thinks of themselves that way can live that way as a rights bearing person. Um, so, so it's not as uncomplicated, I think, as my somewhat legalistic definition of citizenship might have suggested. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, like I said, there was one question that came in written, so I'll, I'll read it out loud. This is from uh, Dr. Moudi Lahmar. Um, he says, according to this analysis, uh, the history and the transformations of the state in the Middle East has been the object of Western history since the 19th century. Um, do you defend this idea? Well, I suppose I would argue that yes, imperialism has been the, you know, left the legacy that we live with now. Um, that's where the lines came from. That's where these states, you know, the animator of these states, it differs to some extent from country to country. And, you know, we could start with Morocco and go to Iran if we wanted to and discuss how this is reflected in various places. Um, but I do, th I do think that, you know, what we think of as the international community is the, if not continuation, I suppose that might be debatable, but certainly the legacy of an imperial um, era that started in Europe in the 17th century. Yes. Okay. Um, if I don't see any more hands raised, but I, I have, I myself have questions that I've been, you know, trying to be respectful to the participants and holding back uh, about. So if there are no questions, any more raised hands, I don't see any here. I can maybe pose my two questions slash go for it. Okay. Um, so um, we heard from Dr. David Lake yesterday about international hierarchy and how the US as an international hegemon has kind of guaranteed sovereignty as an enforcer of the international system, um, given that international organizations, even the UN are quite constrained. Um, so I was wondering if I could kind of get your impression of how does that understanding of state sovereignty and who guarantees state sovereignty 
um, change our understanding of it. Um, because I'm, I'm kind of inclined to say that no um, state can, can, I don't know, claim necessarily sovereignty if the citizens themselves don't accept the state's relationship to the hegemon, essentially. And, and so that also leads me to kind of questioning, like, what's the connection between sovereignty and legitimacy? So that's kind of my first question. And then the second question was, if we were to take, you know, I, I know some people have pushed back a little bit on this, but if we were to say, okay, there are in some ways that the state is retreating, can the state's retreat in your, in, in, from your perspective be connected to the decline and the retreat of the international hegemon and kind of the, the rise of, let's say, multipolarity with the rise of other you know, powers that um, are, are kind of exerting control in certain, in certain parts of the world, particularly in the media region. Um, yeah, so that, that was kind of just my initial impressions that I wrote down. I don't know how clear those initial impressions are, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I actually, I, I think, let me start with the second one. I, I haven't, well, neither of these have I thought very deeply about this. So this is going to be a little bit off the top of my head, but thank you because I would like to think a little bit more about them. Um, the decline of the international hegemon um, seems to me to be both cause and effect probably um, of the kinds of things that I was describing. Um, I think the, obviously the, you know, sort of triumphalist approach of the United States after the end of the Cold War was um, misguided in many different ways. But one of the things that I think it, pro, it, it discouraged thinking about was the extent to which the sort of neoliberal accent on the financialization of the world and the magic of the marketplace more broadly um, would actually also undermine the United States. So the United States in political terms, if you will, won, or at least it conceptualized itself as having won. So it was the world hegemon and, you know, in military security terms, obviously continues to be extremely powerful. But if as I am suggesting, there was sort of another narrative going on simultaneously, which is who cares about that anyway? It's really all about finance. It's all, really all about the market. It's about sovereign wealth funds and so forth and so on. Then the United States was not paying attention to the fact that that this could actually also weaken the capacity of the United States as both domestically and internationally. Um, so I would, I would, I mean, I think it will be interesting to see whether it is correct that we've kind of come to the low water mark of the retreat of the state in general, if that's the case. And certainly if it's a case in the Middle East, then I think it's probably the case elsewhere as well. Um, and that there's a, a resurgence of an accent on political capacity um, both domestically in the United States. And keep in mind, as a resident of the United States, um, since I got, you know, for the last, well, forever, but um, in and out um, recently, one of the things that's quite striking is the, you know, lack of capacity in this country. I mean, you know, the COVID COVID has demonstrated that to the world. This is a country that can't seem to manage what used to be its bread and butter, you know, good public administration. So to some extent, I think that is a function of an abdication isn't quite the right word, but a withdrawal from responsibilities that were once associated and the assumption that the market would do this. And the market obviously didn't solve how to distribute virus tests or vaccines or anything. If it weren't for American government support for all sorts of things, this country would be in even worse condition. So that's also reflected internationally because why would any other sovereign of the world rely on a, the United States, um, which can't even keep its own house in order? So I think 
you know, that triumphalism was wrong on many different dimensions, but what it also did was permit us not to pay as much attention to the consequences of a reliance on the market for all sorts of stuff. Um, on sovereignty and legitimacy, um, I actually, you know, this is a cop out, but I'm going to do it anyway. I've always hated the idea of legitimacy because I don't know how you can tell it when it's there. The only time you can see it is when it's gone. And then you can say, aha, see, it was legitimate before and now it's not. I just, I don't, so I, I've always avoided thinking in those terms and tried to figure out whether there is a more tangible empirical way of describing relationships between governments and citizens or some governments and other governments and so forth and so on. So, um, I, you know, that's probably not a fair way to approach the question, but if you want to rephrase it in a way that isn't about legitimacy, I might be able to address it, but I've always been worried about that because I don't know when something, as I say, you know, the Arab Spring taught us, if it taught us nothing, it taught us that we didn't know legitimacy when we saw it. We, you know, we didn't to this day know which governments are legitimate as opposed to stable, as opposed to lots of other things. Yeah, no, uh, um, I, I sympathize. It's quite a tenuous concept. Um, I just, you know, the, your lecture paired with Dr. Lake's lecture uh, kind of just brought to my mind, like, when can a state actually claim sovereignty in this international system in which they are undemocratic? So they don't even, they cannot even claim to be really representative or accountable of the people that they govern. But they're also not really the masters of their own control and their own territory and their own uh, like you said, um, monopoly on violence. So like, yeah, I just was. No, I, I think I, it's, I mean, this is why I think going back to the peace of Westphalia is so valuable. Those princes were not exactly popular. They weren't accountable. They didn't, th this was a deal among themselves to say, I'm not going to bother you if you don't bother me. And we will agree on that. And we will agree to have this sort of, um, the, what becomes the international community. So how do you get into that? somebody says you should be invited in. Um, and somebody is willing to vouch for you being one of the princes. But the tension between these different conceptions of statehood, of a Weberian state, which has a, some kind of relationship to its population, and a Westphalian state, which is defined by its relationship with other states, other sovereigns, and it doesn't matter what it's like domestically. And it is deliberately, explicitly, it doesn't matter what it's like domestically. You do what you want in your state, I'll do what I want in my state. There is a tension in that. Um, and I think one of, this is one of the reasons why the Westphalian system can out, well outlast the capacities of the constituent parts. So you can have the hollowing out if you will, or actually in much of the Middle East, the failure ever to develop a Weberian capacity. And it's not really going to change very much about the Westphalian recognition of, because I have an interest in, even though I know you're completely incompetent and in incapable of running your own affairs, I have an interest in not saying so, so that you don't start talking about what I'm doing. This is one of the reasons why Afghanistan is still a member of the United Nations. Not because it's a, a Weberian state at all, but because there's a, a, a Westphalian common interest in saying until we have a very different way of organizing the world, I would rather have members of this United Nations that are well known to be incompetent or well known to be rapacious or well known to be whatever awful thing they are this is, you know, Trujillo, this is Franklin Roosevelt's, at least they're our bastards. And in that sense, collectively, we now have, it's not just Roosevelt and, you know, it's not just the Cold War. We all have an interest. We, the rulers of states, 
all have an interest in saying, these are the rules, you don't interfere with me and I won't interfere with you. I'm not gonna, you know, um, and, and, and then you get this civil society, the sort of human rights watches of the world saying, well, we're gonna talk about what you're doing domestically, but the, we don't really think that states should be doing that with each other. So there's a lot of willingness to keep the system going by um, you know, floating regimes that are reprehensible, but they're the ones in power. Yeah. Um, I know that there's one more question, but unfortunately we're out of time. So let me end the session. And then if Dr. Anderson has like two minutes to, to speak to, to the participant, um, uh, she, can, she can do so. But thank you all very much for this interesting discussion and for Dr. Anderson's, uh, thank you for your lecture. And um, we will uh, meet back in half an hour for uh, Aran's uh, presentation. So thanks all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. So I think Maria.